What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Optimization Academy with myself, Dr. Greg Jones. I am extremely excited for our guest today. Our guest today is Dr. Juan Bautista, who I met recently at a conference in Vegas. It was a Peptide World Congress. Dr. Bautista was talking about TRT, but it's, it was like, wait a minute, what was he doing talking about testosterone at a Peptide conference? Because at the end of the day, it's a cellular medicine conference, right? So we're talking cellular medicine, we're talking health, we're talking optimization, and TRT and peptides are very, you know, incredibly important for that. So that being said, let me tell you guys about Dr. Bautista. Dr. Bautista was born in Milwaukee, Midwest, you know, originally. We couldn't keep him. We couldn't keep him. And he grew up in Fresno, California. He walked onto the Fresno State football team, earned a scholarship and was named a team co-captain. He completed his pre-medical studies at Columbia University in New York and then graduated from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I don't know, for those who've been living on a rock or under a rock, those are two <laughs> major schools. So that's awesome. And congrats <laughs> to Dr. Bautista. After returning to Fresno, he's worked in primary care for over seven years, has two offices with his major interests in nutrition, exercise, and global health. Dr. Bautista specializes in men's health and also offers regenerative medicine, TRT, peptide therapy, nutrition, treatment for erectile dysfunction, IV therapy, and varicose vein therapy. But he is most proud of his work through the Bautista Foundation. This foundation gives scholarships to students interested in health, law, agriculture, visual and performing arts, and community service. The most recent scholarship is the Unfinished Business Scholarship designed for students who return to school after their athletic careers. Again, Dr. Juan Bautista is passionate about, he said, <clears throat> I want to repeat that, I missed the word there. Dr. Juan Bautista is passionate about health, education, and community service. So, Dr. Bautista, welcome to the show. And thank you for having me. I'm excited to be actually, for, when I met you there in Vegas, man, it's energy. I'm a big fan of energy. And I even gave that demonstration, right? Energy is never created or destroyed, but transferred, right? Laws of thermodynamics. And you had great energy. So when you asked me to come on, I said, absolutely, man, absolutely. I appreciate that. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to me. I was just like, when you were on stage, I'm like that guy, I want that guy on the show. Like, He's gonna be my next guest, man. I was, I like, like, I was like stalking you. I was like, where's he at? There's a guy right there. I got a corner, man. You know, at the bar, give him a couple, a couple drinks. We got this, man. Yeah, we had a good drinks in there. You know it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. No, thank you, man. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. So we are here today to talk about optimizing your testosterone replacement therapy. So. Uh, a lot of guys and gals out there, you know about testosterone, you know how important this hormone is, but you know, when it comes down to it, we get a lot of patients that come in and like, I think I'm low in testosterone, maybe because they have friends that have had low testosterone, maybe they've been on the internet, maybe they just did some research on their own. But for you, Dr. Bautista, when someone comes in, what are the signs and symptoms that you're looking for that make you think they may be low in testosterone? So, so I, I love that you said that, right? So there, we've had all these huge companies that are out there nowadays and not bad mouthing them, but I referenced a study that was published in 2017 in JAMA that talked about 80%, uh, it was actually over 80% of patients that have started testosterone replacement therapy usually quit within a year because they don't have any follow-up. And in a lot of reasons, in my belief, that's because is us as physicians are, you know, uh, uh, whether we're doing DOs, MDs, naturopathic, we, we have to see that we're more than just testosterone doctors, man. We're here to take care of the body as a whole. And so when people come across with low testosterone, it doesn't always have to be those big companies that talk about fatigue, low libido, uh, inability to lose fat. For other things, it can be things such as acanthosis, right? Pre-diabetic, uh, people that uh, they turn around and they say, man, doc, I've been uh, walking or, or running for the last six months and I've only lost two pounds, right? What's going on? Or the other thing, I don't got energy to go to the gym, right? So, so it, it's very complex. And what I try to look at it is looking at every person as a whole. And I tell people from the beginning, I'm not a true testosterone doctor. Uh, I like to look at it as, as a cellular medicine approach and look at everything. But the main complaint that I do get is uh, uh, fatigue, 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 fatigue. So when I hear fatigue, obviously, you know, that's very complex. Uh, um, you know, it can be from poor sleep habits. It can be from hyperinsulinemia, right? So we see some with acanthosis, skin tags. They're, I always give the, the analogy, you know, if we eat a big Thanksgiving dinner, right? Everybody thinks it's tryptophan, uh, but it's usually all the food. Your insulin's high, you're falling asleep on the couch, watching my Chicago bears here fall asleep or lose, uh, unfortunately. So you get tired, right? Well, hyperinsulinemia can cause fatigue. And what happens, or even, even if we have patients on certain medications, uh, us as doctors, sometimes we put patients, young guys on beta blockers, right? Beta blockers that are slowing the heart rate down. And here we are trying to get a guy to lose weight, exercise, and we're putting them on beta blocks. So all those types of things that can contribute to fatigue need to be looked at. So what I usually do when someone comes in uh, that I think may have low testosterone, 
I like to do a full panel just to make sure I don't miss other things. I personally do it, it and I know a, a lot does depend on insurance or where they're at financially, but I like to check the thyroid, B12, uh, uh, vitamin D, right? I, I gave some great examples at our clinic, uh, C-peptide and insulin, all those things, a cortisol level, all those things play into um, my diagnosis when it's low testosterone. And, and I'll kind of back up a little bit. Sorry, I get hyper about this stuff. I, uh, I, you know, I'm not Mother Teresa, but two and a half days a week, I actually dedicate to taking care of uh, the underinsured and the, the elder, the poor. And so what does that have to do with testosterone? Testosterone replacement therapy, this is what I showed in some of the lectures, other than just energy, has been shown to decrease cardiovascular health, right? Has been shown, uh, or cardiovascular risks, I'm sorry, has been shown to improve uh, insulin sensitivity or decrease insulin resistance. There's so many benefits that I help my patients to go with. And this is one of the most affordable, so to speak, but also more bang for your bucks type of treatments we can get our patients rather than just saying, hey, uh, Mr. Hernandez, you need to lose weight. You need to get exercise better. If you don't have any fuel in that gas tank, you're not going to go lose weight, right? Or you're not going to go to the gym. You're not going to exercise. So when, when I see a patient, I ask those basic questions, right? You know, uh, how are their, how's their sleep? How's their sex life? I think that's very important, right? Uh, you know, what do they do for a living? Are they working graveyard shift? All those studies that we have, whether it's uh, blood pressure or, or low testosterone, patients with, uh, that are working these night shifts can have really, really bad sequelae due to that. So all these things pay into effect when I'm looking at testosterone. So yes, I check my free total testosterone. I check my estrogen, PSAs, right? All those big things. But I also add those things, vitamin D, B12, insulin, C-peptide. And, and for those, uh, I, I know that you have a mix of clinicians and then just regular patients. The reason a C-peptide is important, right? C-peptide and insulin, right? They're together in the pancreas. It's, uh, insulin is not a very stable molecule. So once it's released by the, by the pancreas, your body can uh, uptake that insulin as needed, but that C-peptide sticks around a little bit. So it's important to check a C-peptide because you can have a person that their A1C is 5.4, 5.5. So they're not a diabetic or even a pre-diabetic, but they're hyperinsulinemic. So you really want to add those kind of things to your repertoire when you're looking for low testosterone. Because if you pump them with testosterone and you're not working on their nutrition, you're not working on their hyperinsulinemia, you're not going to get the best results. Yeah, and I love that you look at the whole person here. You mentioned a lot of the labs that we also do here. You know, vitamin D is a big one. I'm going to look at cortisol as well. Yeah. We're going to look at DHEA. You know, we're going to look at CMP. You know, we're going to look at lipids the whole nine because you hit it, you know, went down that path. It's perfect because if you're eating a crappy diet, we call that right. standard American diet, you are going to have the, the insulin resistance and, you know, cholesterol levels. Although you do need, do need healthy cholesterol to make testosterone, right. but there's something is too much of that, right? Right. So we right. look at all that. And then you're looking at the entire picture, right? So when I have my you know, intake questionnaire, I'm asking about, have you experienced, are you dealing with high blood pressure? Do you have sleep apnea? Are you diabetic? We get those metabolic syndrome questions. Is your waist over 40 inches, you know, right. and all these things take into account because it, it's yes, there are signs and symptoms of low, low, of low testosterone. Yes, very, very true. And that's a standard list. And again, you can, we can Google that, right? You know, yeah, yeah. To, <laughs> you, know, you know, we didn't have to spend hundreds of thousand dollars to tell you that. Right, but right. It's why. Right. It's the why, right? Because right. at the end of the day, like there's, there's andropause. It's like, okay, Father Time's coming for us all. It is what it is, you yep. know? So Absolutely. although I have had a couple of guys in their 60s, like, not on TRT, like, how is your testosterone 900? I'm the yeah. most jealous human right now, you know? And my dad, my dad's 700, he's 67, he's a big man. Like, no, he's like, damn, man, you know? So look yeah, at you, yeah. man. It's like, you know, it's like, unfortunately, I've been bombarded with all the environmental toxins. So I guess this <laughs> is what it is. I've been just a sponge. But, yeah. you know, we want to look at all that and run those right labs, run those right labs because it's about the evaluation, right? And, right. and the great thing, another great thing you said is about we're not here to treat the numbers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, it, this is not that we're here. You know, it helps to confirm a potential diagnosis or say, hey, this is something we can work on. Right. But what's going on with you? Yeah. You, you got it, man. Like, oh, dude, like your stress, your sleep. It's a simple question, man. I feel like we don't ask enough. Are you happy? Yeah. Like, yeah. Dude, are you happy? You know, and I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, sort of kind of, you know, yeah. because that's going to, you know, there's going to be a stress contribution to that. You know, absolutely. So, you know, I, I think you hit it on, on a lot of points, especially cortisol, nutrition. There's so many factors. Oh, yeah. uh, one of the things that is so rampant in the Hispanic population, well, actually in the, just the U.S. population, general, but I'll say Hispanic population, is something called fatty liver disease, right? So fatty liver disease, which is an inflammatory disorder, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy disorder because it's one of the few disorders that can run from straight inflammation or hepatitis 
all the way to uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, meaning it doesn't need to fall into cirrhosis yet. So it's that important. But the reason I bring that up is when I get patients that come in and their testosterone, let's say their, their, their testosterone is low at 150, 200, and we're going to get them on testosterone. But if they also have fatty liver, that's so important to take care of that. Because later on in this conversation, we'll talk obviously about the, the side effects of estrogen and things of that nature, right? But fatty liver disease, when I look at it and, and you know, naturopathic doctors and DO doctors do a much better job than allopathic doctors and break this down. But fatty liver disease is, is so important because how would I say this? So, so sucrose, right? Which is a, a disaccharide of fructose and glucose, right? Well, fructose is metabolized in our body through a GLUT5 transport, right? That GLUT5 transporter goes straight to our liver. Our liver has a 10 times higher affinity for that fructose and glucose, right? So, so fructose, one stores in our liver, right? But two, when we look at high fructose corn syrup, depending on the concentration, we're not getting a fructose glucose, we're getting fructose fructose. So what does fructose do in our body? So fructose if you wanted to make it uh, elementary, if you think about bears and all these animals, they eat a lot of berries, right, in the spring to store fat, right, because they're going to hibernate in, in the, you know, in the, in the summertime, or I'm sorry, in the wintertime, but well, we're not going to hibernate anytime soon. But the other thing that's funny about fructose, and there's a great article on hepatology that I could send if, if you guys want the reference, that breaks down the metabolism of fructose through fructose kinase. Well, fructose actually over a period of time, and it's short, it's about two days, actually decreases ATP production. Isn't that amazing? So in other words, it puts us not in an energy burning state, but an energy conserving state. And so all these things are so important to me when I'm talking to a patient about uh, uh, testosterone replacement therapy, because I could get his levels to 900, shoot, I get him 1200, but if he still has fatty liver disease, we're not, well, actually we won't get to those levels with it, that unless we're giving massive doses you know, what's going to happen is he's going to have other side effects. And that's why I agree. We look at it as a whole. Now, what I love about naturopathic doctors and, and then DOs, they know much more than myself in terms of adding milk thistle, adding N-acetylcysteine, selenium, things like that for your liver, intermittent fasting, fasting diets. But the other thing is being just legit with your patients. I, I gave an example in my conference uh, or at the conference on my speech on a patient that was drinking six sodas a day. Man, if you tell him to quit drinking six sodas a day, he's going to hate us. He's going to have relative hypoglycemia. So we have to be legit and say, yes, we're going to give you testosterone, but we also got to go from six sodas a day to four sodas a day, four sodas a day to three. And guess what? Once we start getting a little, maybe we don't need that soda with high fructose corn syrup. Maybe we get sodas with regular sugar. Now, I'm not saying that's healthy, but working with that patient, that should be the end goal when we're dealing with that, that, um, you know, that janitor that maybe can't afford the peptides and all this other regenerative medicine. We still give them that same opportunity to be as healthy as he can be. Right. So I'm a big fan. I, I look at all those things. That's great. That's great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of fast forward our conversation a little bit. As in, you know, as, and that being said, because, OK, because, again, I, we were talking before this is I don't, you know, put out information that we can easily Google or they should know. But we're going to talk about it. From, I love that we're looking at different angles of it. Yeah. But let's say we have our patient. We looked at their lifestyle. We looked at their background. We ran ran our labs to confirm. All right. And. You know, we have our full talk with them about the yeah. benefits of it. And, yeah. we, and really quickly, you know, for those who don't know, I think everyone on this should know at this point, you're listening to a, a you know, podcast on TRT here, obviously. Yeah. And we mentioned it a little bit, but we kind of just lock it in. If better energy, better strength, better endurance, better recovery, better libido, better erectile function, better how do I say this? lowering the risk of all cause mortality and chronic disease. Dr. Bautista mentioned that a little bit earlier. So we go through all that. We tell you the benefits of it. But one thing I think that a lot of patients are not educated on are the risks, like what are the side effects and how to yeah. recognize the side effects. And that's where I want to spend the next part of this and our part two on that, because knowing that is how you're going to optimize your TRT, because as Dr. Bautista said, we can get you on the right dose. We can get your levels high, you know, as depending on all the pathways and all that, but how, just because your levels are high doesn't mean you feel good. Right, right. And so that being said, there are certain pathways that, that affect that. So let's just kind of talk about those. What are some of the pathways that can lead to someone not feeling great on TRT? So, so one of the first things with testosterone replacement therapy is some of the, be some of the benefits can be too much of a benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I would say, and this is, most people know this, uh, men need estrogen just like women need testosterone and they need those in the right balance, right? And so going back to the first thing I mentioned, 80% of people drop testosterone because they're not getting labs. You know, for my practice, I make sure they're getting routine labs. Actually, it's every three months for me. And, and one of the reasons is estrogen. 
So everybody's different. But if I get that patient that comes in low testosterone, low estrogen, right? People with sleep apnea, high stress, concussions, things like that. Uh, a lot of doctors, lawyers, uh, police officers that are go, go, go. They're really, really low. And so what happens, uh, it, not at all. I also talk about every doctor has different protocols and I respect those, right? May not agree with all of them, but I respect them. And so if a, someone is on testosterone replacement therapy with low estrogen and they're given an estrogen blocker, man, it, they're still not going to feel optimized. They're not going to optimize their testosterone. On a bodybuilder note, you, I get a lot of bodybuilders that come in, you know, they like to look dry. So yeah, though, testosterone is great, but they're tearing pecs. They're popping biceps. They have no estrogen, you know, uh, just as a, a, a woman will go through menopause, a man will also feel very irritable, low sex drive, things like that. And then you can look at it at the opposite end too. Uh, you know, uh, people that are taking testosterone that maybe isn't, isn't prescribed by their doctor or someone's following, they can take massive doses or doses or, or street testosterone that just estrogenates, right? Uh, and, and you get people with very, very, very high estrogen and too much estrogen. Of course, you're going to talk about, you know, water retention, uh, listening to Celine Dion, just kidding. Uh, uh, but also we worry about our prostate, right? So just like for a woman, you know, too much uh, uh, inflammatory estrogens, and we could break it down from estrone to estro estriol, estradiol, but too much estrogen isn't good for a woman. It just too much estrogen isn't good for a man either, right? It's about that right balance in life. So those are, that's one of the first things I talk about. One, find someone, even if it's not me, find someone that's going to check on you. Even the best athletes have a coach, right? Even the best power lifters have a coach. Well, for TRT, you should definitely have a coach that's watching you through it, right? And you might say, oh, sure, you know, you're right. I am retaining a little bit more water. Or, man, doc, man, I, I'm still feeling sluggish. Well, maybe your estrogen's a little bit too low, you know? So I would say first risk, first risk is, got to make sure my thumb's in the camera here. First risk is estrogen. That can be too low, that can be too high. And that's why, again, testosterone replacement therapy isn't cookie cutter. Different doctors are going to have different values. You know, I, I like to keep mine between 20 and 30, but I, I definitely want my patients to have estrogen. I don't want my patients to have too much estrogen. Uh, there, you can definitely go through different pathways as well. Uh, I know the pregnenolone steel is not considered, it's a little old fat, but I love the concept of it. And hormones are important. And you might see a estrogen dominance because of low progesterone and things like that uh, due to stress, due to lack of sleep, all these things that are important to check. So, so along with your estrogen, most uh, providers that do this will also check other levels. They're going to check your FSH, LH. They're going to check your progesterone and estrogen. So if you're looking to optimize your testosterone, I personally, I'm not, not saying I'm against these home kits, but these home kits that just look at testosterone or just look at it, uh, 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 at testosterone and PSA, there's more to it that to that. If you want to optimize your testosterone, you need to optimize your estrogen. You need to optimize your progesterone, things like that. And I, I love that analogy, or you know, knowing that you know the estrogen can be too low and also too high. I was telling yeah. my patients, estrogen and man, it's Goldilocks. Yeah, really, very much Goldilocks, man. It's got to be right in that green zone, right? Because yeah. man, too yeah. low is an issue, too high is an issue. And then one of the things that you know, I've had patients come in and they see their and nothing against their urologist, and they say, hey, you know, you're on TRT. I'm worried about you getting prostate cancer. I'm like, it's not the testosterone, it's the estrogen, man. Yep. It's the yep. localized estrogen, right? That's that can proliferate prostate cancer. So testosterone can be protective against that, but that can be a whole other podcast, right there, a whole other episode, right, there, right? Actually, so, I have, I have a, gosh, I have it, um. I have it right here. I have my uh, study, right? Well, there's several studies, but basically, oh, here we go. So actually, I'm going to pull this up for two seconds here. Uh, 2015, testosterone prostate cancer. This is from the, the, um, the Journal of Urology. And basically, they've shown that there is, has not been shown to be a risk of prostate cancer with testosterone replacement therapy, right? And most urologists know this nowadays, right? So it's, and it's also, I'm sorry, also for patients that have a family history of prostate cancer, it hasn't increased the risk. So I absolutely agree with you. It's not the testosterone replacement therapy that's leading to prostate cancers. It's the other things, right? It's the estrogens. It's the inflammation, right? Inflammation that we can catch godly on, on uh, uh, estrogens that we get from plastics and things like that, uh, yep. or, you know, inflammation in general from our diet. You know, it's, isn't it crazy? There was an article and the, the pandemic kind of messes me up. I want to say... It was about two years ago. Uh, awesome doctor here in Chicago referenced it from BMJ, British Medical Journal, that talked about inflammatory foods, I'm sorry, processed foods and the increased risk of cancer. They actually gave it a numerical value. 
But what was scary is they said about 86%, just so my numbers are right, let's say above 80% of our American diet comes from ultra processed foods. And they broke, to, they broke down the increased risk of cancers. And it was basically from eating you know, two hot dogs a day, sausage, bacon, deli meat, all those inflammatory things that raise up some of these estrogens as well. Isn't that crazy? And if you think about it, man, who are we feeding these things to? To our kids. Isn't that nuts? So, you know, I'm not here to go against a uh, vegan or to say, go eat meat, but I think processed food in general is one of those things that is contributing to all of this. So when you're taking testosterone replacement there and you're really worried about prostate cancer, yes, look at your estrogen, right? Make sure you have doctor, but also look at your inflammation. Look at what you're putting into your body. And so that speaking of prostate here leads to another <laughs> pathway here is that yeah. one of the things we talk about is okay, you know, because people talk about when they're on testosterone, there's that risk of getting acne, oily skin, yep. or hair loss, or excessive yep. hair growth, or yep. prostate enlargement, right? And right. we we also take a look at what's called dihydral testosterone, which is dihydral a more potent form of testosterone, and that's another pathway to not feeling optimized on your testosterone. So, how do you, you know, how do you address that in your clinic, or a better way, like? A better way to say that is, what are you seeing with elevated DHT with some of your testosterone patients? Absolutely. So elevate, again, it's all about balance, right? And so people will look online and they'll say, DHT, it's a more potent testosterone. We need more DHT. And, and that's actually not necessarily true. It's all about balance, right? The exact same thing with growth hormones and things like that. So usually when I see elevated DHT in my clinic, right, uh, you'll see these guys, and I won't say the bad word, but they'll call it DECA, D-I-C-K, right? So in other words, they say, or these guys, or even if they're not on that, they'll come in. I just had a young Marine, uh, 36, 37 years old. He comes in, he goes, doc, man, I need, you know, some, some Viagra. And I go, uh, well, let me guess here. Young, he was fit. They check out his testosterone. His testosterone was uh, about 420, not too bad, right? But first thing he says, like, well, let me, let me check. Let me guess. You, you can get erection, right? But it goes soft midway through. Or round two takes forever. And the missus is like, hey, what's going on? And you're like, oh man, you know, it's going to take a while. We look at him, sure enough, you take off their cap and they're balding, right? DHT needs to be in balance as well. So when we have too much DHT, right? That's what we give medications like finasteride. Finasteride is a DHT blocker when the prostate gets enlarged, right? Or you can actually give a lower dose of finasteride for hair growth, right? Or, I'm sorry, not for hair growth, to prevent hair loss with, with uh, a DHT conversion. So balance is another thing. So unfortunately, the labs that are out there can be pretty darn expensive. Uh, so a lot of times I go syst uh, uh, with symptoms, right? If something comes with symptoms, that's what I'm really trying to uh, treat, or I'm looking at them with a physical exam, right? If someone has low uh, testosterone, elevated estrogen, you can almost guarantee that that DHT is going to be elevated as well. So now I hope you guys and gals out there <laughs> listening to this are understanding like, you know, these are things that you know, if, if you note a theme that is going on here is that, yes, we're going to look at last for things, but there's certain things you're going to feel. Yeah. You, yeah. You're going to notice it. So, and speaking of feeling, this leads into the other pathway I want to talk about is that one of the things I tell my patients and you can kind of jump in and, you know, I love talking about this with you because kind of do the same thing. It's like, look yeah, at the mirror yeah. here. So <laughs> is that we'll talk about one of the reasons why people's energy gets better on testosterone is because their kidneys are producing more of another hormone called erythrocoetin. So you're yep. making more yep. red blood cells. So more red blood cells, more, more, more red blood cells, more oxygen to tissue, right. get more energy, right? The issue yeah. is, is that you're not making more blood. You're just making more cells so yeah. that blood can get thicker. Yeah. Right. And so when that happens, there are certain symptoms, there are certain things you can feel. Absolutely. And so if you want to talk about that, that would be. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. And so, so as a matter of fact, doctors used to treat anemia uh, with uh, testosterone. Right. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's one of those things. And I think in, in um, Europe, some doctors, a lot of doctors still have that as a, as a, a way to treat patients with anemia. And the problem with thick blood, so to speak, some people call it erythrocytosis or polycythemia, secondary polycythemia. The problem is it can have some sequelae if it is too thick, right? And one of them that you'll see is blood pressure. And I'll make it very simple in the sense that your body has different barometers, right? Measurements of our blood. And when it says, when the blood is seen as too thick or too concentrated, so to speak, your body can think that it's dehydrated. And so what happens through a mechanism with your afferent tubules of your, of your kidneys, it clamps down and your blood pressure rises up, right? So one of the things that we'll see with patients with secondary polycythemia is or I'm sorry, with patients on TRT, they can see that their blood pressure starts going up. Now that, that's one of them. It can be again from polycythemia. It can be from estrogen, retaining a lot of water weight as well, things like that. But that's one thing to monitor is your blood pressure, right? 
Uh, the other thing that you have to be careful with with the secondary polycythemia is people that have sleep apnea. People that have sleep apnea, especially if it's not treated, um, they can it can actually um, increase as it is right. Their body's trying to make make more blood to get more oxygen. That's what sleep apnea is, right? You become apneic at night. So your body tries to make more blood. So you already have a risk of being polycythemic. Add test testosterone replacement without correcting your sleep apnea. You can even get thicker blood. Thicker blood, again, not good for the small vessels such as your kidneys, uh, such as uh, the vessels of your eyes, but also for blood pressure. Um, so I think that's one of the things, again, you have to be, treat this again like a fine old machine and say, Instead of saying, um, well, I'll just get on a blood pressure medication. No, no, correct the problem, correct the problem. A lot of that can be uh, endovascular dysfunction. A lot of that can be, again, polycythemic. Some, the, the struggle I have, Doc, and I'm sure you do too, is uh, the, I call it the gym technique. They go and they have their buddies at the gym. They said, Doc, I'm, I'm too low of a dose, so I doubled it. My buddy over here is taking this much. You're like, oh my gosh, right? And so a lot of times I can see that secondary polycythemia, boom, right off the bat because they're following their their gym buddies advice versus ours. It's, it's about building up that right dose for that patient. Yeah. And then I'll ask the question, they're like, oh, you know, oh, I got it from a buddy, double my <laughs> dose. I've, I've never done therapeutic phlebotomy. And then yeah. I'll say, how long does it take yeah. you to get tired when you start a workout? Like, oh man, 10 minutes, two yeah. sets in, I'm sweating. I'm yeah. like, pass out. I'm like, all right, bro, let's just, let's just yeah. run your life. We, we got to get you checked out here. We got to get, get you checked out. Here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, you know, we didn't go to the far end of it is that if you allow that polycythemia mm -hmm. and that hematocrit to go unchecked, it's a stroke risk. It's clock yeah, risk, it's a stroke right? risk. And actually, you know, where I, where I will see it too is so a lot of bodybuilders, a lot of gym guys, just from, you know, the, the, the pressure we're doing when we're squatting, lifting, you know, 20% of our population has varicose veins, right? I treat varicose veins as well. So a lot of times I'll see these guys come in with phlebitis. So they actually have a superficial thrombus. So not a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, definitely a, a lot more serious, but a superficial uh, uh, phlebitis. So meaning a leg that just, lo it looks almost like cellulitic. Oh, it gets hot, tender, these veins. That can be a, a sign that, hey man, this guy is uh, what they say in the gym, stacking, right? Not stacking properly, meaning they're not really looking into things. So you, you definitely going back to it, you want your coach, you want your coach, whether it's Dr. Greg, which is Dr. B, you want someone checking you out and making sure again, that your hematocrit or your hemoglobin aren't too high, but again, in the right range. Perfect. Perfect. So, Hey man, we got to stop giving stuff away. Is this is what we charge for. So, nah, that's, that's right. okay. yeah. no, so we are definitely going to come back with part two and we're going to talk about how you and your doc some options for men. Uh, sorry. We're going to come back with part two and talk about how you and your doctor, your primary care provider can manage. We've already talked about identifying these side effects, but how you can manage them, how you can mitigate them, how you can avoid them. We're going to talk about that in part two. But before we get out of here, Dr. Bautista, where can we find you? Oh man. So, you know, I, uh, I'm pretty active on my social media on Instagram. I'm at Dr. B fit MD spelled out doctor. Of course. Uh, I'm also, I have a foundation, the Bautista foundation, uh, also on Instagram. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm really big on is global health. Uh, every year I go to about three different countries, uh, Cuba, Colombia, Honduras. Uh, I'm actually going to be going out, helping out with some of the refugees from Haiti this weekend, uh, as well as, um, um, you know, uh, going back to Colombia, you know, it's just one of the things I like to do. Love taking students, love, uh, I, I train a lot of PAs and NPs. Uh, so yeah, you can always check me out on my social media. And uh, I think that's about it. Yeah, the website I never really look at. <laughs> and I, went, I went there and I was like, all right, I found the website. I found it. I found it. And I was like, all right, let's just, I, was, I got really excited on the website looking at some of the different therapies that you, that you mm -hmm. offer. So hey guys, that's it for now, but we will be coming back very soon with part two. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned a lot. If you have questions or comments for myself or Dr. Bautista, please leave them below and we'll talk to you soon. Yes.